before we go into our interview today, I wanted to let everyone know we have a new sponsor for our Energy Question podcast, the U.S. Oil and Gas Association, or USOGA for short. First established in 1917, USOGA has been an effective and creative voice for the industry for more than a century now. USOGA is dedicated to educating the public, policymakers, and legislators at the federal, state, and local levels about the value of the domestic oil and natural gas industry. If you're in the industry and not currently a USOGA member, please consider joining the association as a way of helping it tell your story to the policymakers whose actions impact everything you do each and every day. You can start that process by contacting USOGA through its website, usoga.org. Thanks so much to USOGA for sponsoring the Energy Question podcast, and now on with our show. Hi, welcome to the Energy Question with David Blackman. I'm your host, David Blackman, and my special guest today is Rusty Hudson. Rusty is the founder and CEO of Diversified Energy, uh, a, an independent producer that uh, most people are not aware, operates more wells in the United States than any other company. Rusty, how are you today? Doing extremely well. Thanks for having me. Well, I really appreciate your time. I uh, <laughs> this is such a an interesting company to me, and and how you're doing it is is just really a great story. So I'm I'm glad you were able to join us. I before we go into the Q and A, I just want to give you a few minutes to kind of talk about Diversified's background and how you came to found the company and uh, uh, the business model, your unique business model that you're implementing. Yeah, no, that's um, it's a great, um, great segue. You know, Diversified is about 22 years old now, believe it or not, which makes me extremely old. Uh, it seems like yesterday when I started the company pretty much from scratch, just bought up some wells in West Virginia um, and really just started growing it from there. Uh, we focused primarily originally on the conventional assets uh, in Appalachia, which had been, uh, you know, were popular in the early 2000s and then became uh, kind of neglected and overlooked as the Marcells and the Utica uh, really started to uh, get popular with the bigger companies. Uh, and then we started acquiring those assets from the bigger companies and um, took the company public in 2017 over in London, uh, which is a whole nother story in and of itself. But just uh, really the primary reason there was uh, we just we needed capital to go after all these assets and, and were just too small for the U.S. markets back in that day. So uh, we were able to get that over and or done, and uh, over the last six, seven years, um, listed in London. Now, uh, you know, over a billion dollar market cap company with uh, assets uh, across the country, as you mentioned, and um, been very successful in growing the business in a very short period of time, utilizing the the London markets uh, really as a catalyst. So it's so interesting to me how you you manage the company. You're you're there in Alabama, um, and your your operational areas. You're in nine states, but uh, your big areas are in the Marcellus Utica region, in Appalachia, and then uh, over in Texas, Louisiana, Oklahoma. Uh, more recently, talk about why you have this model of having your your administration there in Alabama and operations uh, all over the place. Well, it kind of worked out. You know, my last banking job, I was I was here in Birmingham and and uh, really started the company based out of here. Um, my wife didn't want to didn't want to move at the time, um, so that was a long time ago. But uh, you know, it's um, it kind of worked out because now we're kind of centrally located between both the Appalachian region and what we call our central region, which is that Texas and Louisiana area. Yeah. Uh, so we're kind of sit right in the middle. But uh, you know, our whole premise of our of our business model really uh, revolves around acquisition of existing mature producing assets, uh, which is a completely different business model than say the, the drillers and, and the exploration companies right. that you typically see in the sector. And really we're one of the only publics that have this business model of acquiring mature producing assets, uh, enhancing production, keeping them in production for longer, elongating their lives in the reserves and, the, the U.S. needs the energy supply. It represents a, a large, you know, these conventional wells represent a large percentage, 10 to 12 percent of our total production in the U.S., and it's very stable, and we need that. And so our, our business model is to try to maintain those, those assets and keep them in production for as long as possible. 
um, keeping the costs down and driving synergies through geographical scale and then paying our um, shareholders a distribution. And we really call ourselves a cradle to grave because we're buying the assets in the mature phase, operating them for, you know, and keeping uh, them in production for as long as possible. But then, you know, uh, having a retirement company that can retire those wells safely yeah. and effectively at the end of life. Now that retirement company, um, uh, retires wells, not just for your company, but also for other companies as well, right? You've become very active in that space in recent years, haven't you? Yeah, we, yeah. we started the business, uh, really because we saw a void in having the, we, we made these commitments to retire a number of wells in the States in which we operated. Um, but we saw a void in the capacity to make that happen. There just wasn't yeah. enough retirement companies out there in Appalachia. And so we, we started our own really just to, to, to retire our own wells at the time. But since then, through the infrastructure bill uh, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, the states have been allotted uh, federal money to uh, plug in, and, and retire their orphan wells that they have responsibility for. And we've been bidding on work and winning work um, related to those uh, plugging programs, which is third party revenue. We also plug for other companies, uh, third party. Uh, and we also administer uh, the federal funding um, uh, in Ohio. So we, we actually administer those contracts and, uh, and, and help the state over there. So it's, it's been a really, really good uh, business for us, not only from the standpoint that we're able to retire our own wells, but help the states retire their wells we're garnering third party revenue that we can then offset the cost of plugging our own um, production or of our right. own wells. And uh, so it's been a great thing for us. So uh, we, we talk a lot about, and I write a lot about uh, operation conditions, operational conditions here in the United States, general business conditions with all the, the new regulation and supply chain challenges and, you know, most of the time when I'm talking about it and writing about it, I'm doing it from perspective of, of the shale business in the United States, because that's been, you know, a huge focus area over the last decade. But I wonder, you know, how does, how does, how do the current economic conditions and regulatory conditions impact a company with this differentiated business model? You know, I would, for example, anticipate, given your business model, the supply chain issues may not be quite as big a concern because you're not doing a lot of drilling, you know, and those kinds of operations that are heavy on equipment. But I, but I don't know the answer to that. How, how's your view on business conditions in the U S well, one thing that we've prided ourselves on is vertically integrating our business. And, and what I mean by that is I want to take as much third party uh, emphasis out of the business as possible for, for a variety of reasons. One being what yeah. you just talked about, you know, having the ability to get work done when you need it, the cost of that work and the inflationary periods that we're seeing as, as we sit here today. Um, but also just, you know, the, the, the regulatory environment, making it more difficult. I don't want to, I want to use as many of our, our own workers because honestly, when you have your own employees and you have your own swap rigs and you have all your own equipment, those people act like owners. They don't act like third-party contractors. Yeah. So we we like that model of being able to vertically integrate and, and have our own people doing our work. They just take more pride in it. Um, but I would say that, you know, look, it's there's no doubt that uh, the administration we currently have in place has made it a little more difficult and challenging for our industry uh, to operate, to move, to produce and move natural gas uh, into some degree oil also. Uh, we need good regulatory environments uh, to be able to produce energy. And I'm not saying um, overly zealous regulatory environments. I'm saying fair regulatory environments where the operator and the regulatory uh, agencies are working hand in hand to make sure that everything is being done properly. But at the same time, we're being able not to be impeded from being able to produce what we truly, truly need. And, and the scary thing about it to me is, is that um, we have the ability as a country to produce our own energy and be self-sufficient. But for some reason, uh, our administration uh, and, our, and would prefer us buy energy from these countries. And, and I think we're seeing it today. Here's this Israeli Hamas conflict going on in the Middle East. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot of comments around whether Iran participated in that. But we're buying energy from people that would wish to kill us and, get, and, and to see us fail as a country. And so 
it, it makes no sense to me. But at the end of the day, I think that, you know, getting a good regulatory environment in place, it doesn't matter who the administration, Democrat, Republican, whatever. Um, it's it's crucial. It's crucial uh, for us to be able to produce uh, and move the natural gas that's necessary to be uh, to have our uh, energy supplies met. So, of course, the, another thing that's been a huge focus point uh, for every company and every industry, really, uh, in the United States in recent years has been ESG, environmental, social, and, and, and governance. Um, and your company, Diversified, has established a heck of a track record in uh, reducing your scope one, scope two emissions, and really uh, uh, even to the point of receiving an award for, for your performance in the ESG sector. How, how have you gone about addressing those things uh, again? Because with your business model, it's a different endeavor than it is for say a Pioneer or Exxon Mobil, you know, because you're, you're, you're just in a different phase of the business. Well, and I think we're in a better phase to be honest. Yeah. I, one, one thing that we did, we said was, look, we can, we can fight this and act like it's not happening, or we can go out and do something about it and take a liability and make it an asset. And so what we decided to do was hit the ESG messaging head on. Um, and so about two, two years ago, we, we set out a plan and said, we're gonna reduce our emissions. We're gonna detect and reduce emissions because for number one, it's the right thing to do. We wanna sell natural gas. We don't want it to, to be emitted into the atmosphere. We want it to go through pipelines into meters and sell it to, to be utilized uh, for energy needs. So that was the first thing we did. So we put, you know, handheld emission detection devices into the hands of our well tenders so they could do periodic reviews of every well in our portfolio. Uh, we do flyover LIDAR of all of our midstream assets and have multi-year contract to do that. We're changing out our pneumatic devices that are um, methane actuated and changing them to air compressed uh, actuation so that uh, there's no uh, emissions, you know, happening there. We're doing yeah true measurement of emissions versus being allocated by the EPA, some, you know, qu quantitative uh, number that nobody knows how they come up with. And so we've done a significant amount of work around these things um, just on the emission detection side, but the social governance, all of that, we've been, you know, uh, being very aggressive. Uh, to your point, uh, we've uh, been double uh, A rated MSCI uh, here recently, which is one down from the best you can be triple A. Uh, we've also been awarded two years in a row now the uh, OGMP, which is the United Nations uh, classification, but OGMP gold standard path with one little area to go to, to get the gold certification, which is tremendous. We're one of four companies in the U.S. that have, have that uh, uh, classification. So we've done all the things that are necessary to be on our front foot because we want to be investable. We want to make sure that our investors are able to invest in our company and not have a reason to pull back. Well, I'm sure that establishing that record has made all the, the critics in the environmental community go away and focus on other companies, right? Never happens. <laughs> Never happens. They always look for something else and they're always, the, you know, it's so funny. I mean, you and I did a uh, uh, an article here recently, uh, I think maybe a month ago or something. And yeah, I, yeah. last week we had some, it brought to my attention, we had some retail blogger that was trying to drive the share price down to some degree. And they were out there quoting our, our article saying that it was, you know, a poorly article, there was lies and all that. I'm thinking they just don't give up. It's just like coming in waves all the time. Yeah, they are tireless, if nothing else. I have to get credit tireless, for that. They are tireless, yes. I've uh, learned you just have to overlook them and just keep on going. Yeah, I, me too. I got attacked by uh, by a group uh, out of London a couple of months ago. And, I, and you know, it just it's the kind of stuff that you, you you're just going to, get you know when you're doing what we do anyway um it is. so let's talk about uh your move into texas oklahoma and louisiana a few years ago i uh you know this is a completely different area than appalachia of course uh, but a lot of similarities operationally too and a lot of a lot of late life wells to to acquire and manage right uh, and uh so talk about what was the motivation for coming into to the central region well, we saw a couple things. Number one, <clears throat> the Appalachian region, um, there was some, you know, some what I would call const constraints of production there in terms of being able to to get your gas out of the region and yeah. get better pricing. Um, and so we said, you know, it, it, then we started looking at 
the, the central region and started noticing that, hey, we got all these LNG export facilities down here. There's about 12 BCF a day uh, of export capacity that's getting ready to expand almost to 30 BCF a day in the next couple of years. To me, that made a lot of sense because we're, we're, we're producing gas in a region that's going to have to provide the Marcellus and the Utica can't get there. Right. And so this area is going to be the, the, the sole focus of getting that, that uh, capacity um, imp- or in, you know, increased. And so it made sense to us that that was going to be an area that's going to have a premium price attached to it for a while. Um, and so we wanted to produce gas in a region that's going to have, you know, capacity pricing, um, and the ability to grow. And so that made a lot of sense to us. And to your point, lots of dislocated assets. What I mean by that, different owners, you know, in the hands of a lot of different, that's a great opportunity for us to go in and to, you know, to bolt on, bolt on, bolt on and grow that uh, production profile down there. And there's a lot of undeveloped acreage down there that we're currently, uh, assessing for future development. And, uh, so we think it's a, it's a great area and Oklahoma is another one. We love Oklahoma. It's just a great regulatory environment. They want you to produce, um, but they want you to do it responsibly, obviously, in which we do. Right. But we think Oklahoma has a big upside also in terms of the same reasons that we talked about on the Gulf Coast, disjointed, dis, uh, dislocated ownership of a lot of assets, lots of opportunities to grow, a lot of private equity backed companies there. And so we, we like our, our options in that area and feel like uh, over the long period that we'll be able to grow it pretty substantially. So uh, are you optimistic that uh, the LNG industry is going to be able to expand that dramatically? Uh, you know, I know all these expansions are in the works, but I just, uh, I'm always concerned about the, the government moving to slow things down. Well, I think most of the ones that I'm talking about have already been approved. So unless yeah. they don't fund them, but, you know, the companies don't come up with the funding, but I think that most of these are kind of, you know, set in stone and already in process. And I think that, look, the world needs it. The world needs our, our U.S. or needs our LNG. I think, you know, Toby Rice does a great job of at, EQ, at EQT of really uh, marketing that concept that, look, we can decarbonize the globe with our U.S. LNG. I mean, yeah. we can replace, we can displace coal. We can get countries like India and others who are desperate for energy and uh, that we have the energy supply for them. And so uh, the U.S. LNG markets are going to be very, very lucrative over the next several years. Um, I, I truly believe that we need a, um, a an export facility on the East Coast. Uh, yeah. You know, we have a small one there now that only does about 800 million a day, but that thing needs to be expanded to two, three BCF at least. And um, now it's going to be a hard <laughs> hard to get done because the regulatory environment in that Northeast region is just, it's, oh, um, it's brutal. It's brutal. Yeah. And yeah, uh, really so is. I think we, it doesn't make sense why we're importing natural gas into Boston Harbor in the winters from other countries when we can <laughs> run a pipeline and supply them with all they need, but New York won't let a pipeline be built. So it's just a lot of, we, we, we need regulatory, um, uh, you know, we need some regulatory bills passed in the in the U.S. Congress that gives, you know, gives us the ability to get these pipelines built and get the infrastructure in place that is so crucial, both not only for natural gas, but really for power, all sorts of power. You know, we we just don't have the ability to put anything up quickly and it's going to come back to bite us at some point. Yeah, I and I don't know what the solution is. You know, the the River Keepers uh, environmental group was so instrumental in blocking pipelines through New York and and the state government there, uh, starting with Governor Cuomo, just became. I mean, it just became a political football for yeah. Governor yeah. Cuomo and Governor Hockel has uh, assumed the same position, and uh, it's it's so ridiculous. It's such an absurd situation. Um that just doesn't seem to have a real solution, um, uh, particularly in this current administration, because it would take the federal government really stepping in strongly to, to solve that. And it's hard to see how that happens with the current political environment. Yeah, and I was very hopeful that there was gonna be some type of regulatory and permitting reform coming. Uh, there, was yeah. a lot of, uh, there was a lot of momentum there, and it just seems like it's kind of fell off the, the map a little bit. 
Um, hopefully it, it re, re energizes itself here pretty soon because without it, pipelines, especially in that Appalachian region, forget about it. I mean, look what it took to get MVP completed. Oh my gosh. And the money and the time and um, I mean, it took a, a, the Supreme Court ruling to get it completed, which was needed. Right. And, and, and you know, I mean, the, the, the sad truth is you don't even know today that, that they're going to be able to finish the line necessarily if the politics become right next year during an election year. I mean, there's still the potential for Joe Biden to sign an executive order denying the completion of the line like he did with, with Keystone XL. I, it, it's so, um, the uncertainty, dealing with the uncertainty of the legal and regulatory environment right now has to be incredibly discouraging. It has to make it a lot more difficult to uh, get to final investment decisions to fund projects like that. Don't you think? Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, pipeline, you know, I talked to my friend at uh, Equitrans and, and uh, who's CEO there and, and what he has went through has just been unbelievable yeah. turmoil for the last four or five years. And um, now to his kudos to him, he stuck it out and said, you know what, they're not going to keep me off this. I'm going to take it all the way to the Supreme Court if I have to. And he was able <laughs> to do that. And it actually paid off. Um, I do believe he'll finish that pipeline by the end of the year, first quarter. Uh, so that there's no further uh, stoppage of work. But I'm telling you, when you're when you have companies that are looking at, do I put the time and energy into a pipeline in Appalachia? I mean, I can't imagine any of anybody's jumping in line to say, let me be first. Um, it's just right. that bad. And, um, you know, I think, you, you know, Texas and Louisiana and Oklahoma have it a little bit better from the standpoint. Like, for for example, Texas can get gas from their state to the Gulf coast without crossing state right. lines. That's a big yeah. benefit. Same with Louisiana. Uh, but when you have to cross that state line and the FERC gets involved, it's a, it's a whole new ball game. Yeah. It makes it a little harder in Oklahoma, although there's a lot of existing pipelines, but if you need to expand it, yeah, FERC's going to get involved in that. That could They're be a real crapshoot. Yeah. I noticed, I, I couldn't help noticing this morning, the price of natural gas domestic price, has risen like 80 cents uh, in a week. Is that due to factors of going into winter season now? Or, or yeah, I think you're, uh, yeah, I think you're seeing a few things take place here, David. I think that there's been some uh, production curtailments and, and production has come down a little bit. Um, I think that, you know, people are setting up their bets for the winter. And so you'll see some shorts come off and people starting to put some longs on, you know, just getting ready for the winter months and thinking that, oh, yeah. don't want to get you don't want to get caught with a bad winter and <laughs> you know, you're know you stuck with two dollar and 50 cent gas. But, um, you know, I think all of those things are playing in. It's, you're, you're really coming out of that shoulder season and going into, um, you know, winter. And and it just seems like this is the time of year where you start to see some of that take place. But I look, I, I'm firmly a believer in. A uh, three to five dollar natural gas price is the place to be, and really, it's great for the producers. It's also great for the users. Last yeah. year was horrible. I mean, that nine dollars and six dollars and four dollars and five dollars. It was all over the place. It was volatile. It's not a good thing for producers. It's hard to manage your business in that type of environment. Um, if you can keep that three to five range and just keep it pretty steady, and and you, where everybody knows what the price is, everybody knows what it costs to produce and uh, you can you can do well and so um I, I think yeah i think you're just seeing some of the shorts come off getting ready for winter and seeing some there's been some little cold spells kick up already and uh, i think it just you know everybody's very short in the market let's just be honest natural gas the mar natural gas market has been really really short and um people are always just kind of waiting on weather it seems like yeah i, I well, it'd be nice. I, I agree with you. It'd be great to have it in the three to five range because everybody can make money and utility bills would be bearable. And, uh, you know, it'd be the ideal. It's kind of like $75 all right. You know, everybody can make money at 75 and the cost at the pump isn't exorbitant. And uh, that's right. But, and that hurts everybody. Know, but, yeah. Right. But of course, that's not the nature of the business, is it? <laughs> uh, it's never been in my 22 years. <laughs> We, we see a lot of stories in the media now about uh, the industry having a hard time 
sourcing quality talent from young people coming out of college. Um, you know, they get inundated with uh, messaging in, in school and in the media that's negative about the industry. And, uh, you know, what do you tell young people when, when about the industry and about your company, when they're trying to figure out what to do for a career in life? Is the industry, the oil and gas industry, a good place for a young person to have a career? Well, I've said all along that we, our industry has been demonized by everybody. I mean, yeah. It starts with it starts with the political environment. It goes into these universities that have become extremely, uh, I don't want to say liberal, but they become very uh, liberal in their in their thought processes as it relates to energy. Um, what I have told our employees, it starts with each one of us. Each one of us has a responsibility to to train and to educate our families about what it takes to energize the U.S. And for people to think that wind and solar is going to be the long-term solution, they're fooling themselves. There's, and if you put the facts in front of people, including your kids, by the way, they get it. Um, and so you show them that there's no way to, to replace natural gas and, and fossil fuels that represent about 78% of our energy supply in the U.S. in terms of electricity generation. There's no way to supply that with wind and solar. Just, it's not going to happen. Um, actually it's 80 some percent, but yeah, you know, when you show them that there's great careers, look, oil and gas is not going anywhere. When you, when you take a, when you take one of these, uh, phones and you tell them, do you realize how much petroleum products this thing utilizes to make, be, to be made? Then they start to see that it's not just about driving your car. And so that there's going to be the need for oil. There's going to be the need for natural gas for all those things, uh, you know, into the future. And oh, by the way, a, a large part of the globe doesn't even have an energy supply yet. So, you know, we're, we're somebody's going to have to step in there to help them get it. So I think, you know, educating our families on it is, is so important and getting the opportunities to, to show young people that the industry is not a demon. It's doing great things. And then, you know, one thing that we've tried to do is to be more, um, uh, uh you know, visible into the, the places yeah. in which we, if you get your name out there and you show them, Hey, we're helping educate kids through scholarships. We're helping, you know, to further the advancement of petroleum engineer schools. And uh, we're doing great things in our community. You start to get your name brands out there and then people start to see these are good places to work. They're good paying jobs. They're, they're long-term. They'll be there for the long haul. And um, I, so that's what we've tried to do. We've tried to do it little by little, um, with our own, you know, with our own families, with our own people in our own communities and in, in the universities and all the things that we have, you know, have reached with. Uh, and so it's been, I, I believe it's been successful. I know today, I believe that the, the oil and natural gas industry has more of a popularity with people than it probably did 10 years ago when it was not under as right, much yeah. attack. And yeah. I think people understand now that we can't, I mean, Texas is a fine example. I mean, look at the, the energy issues they've had. And that's one of our biggest energy producing states in the country. But they have their problems in the grid and with the grid and, you know, trying to use solar and wind to too much. And you, it's not a base supply. And so I think just educating our kids and starting each family, starting with their own and expanding from there, I think it makes a difference. And I do believe that people are starting to, to turn the messaging around a little bit. Yeah, my granddaughter, who is uh, 12, uh, told me recently that uh, she'd had a teacher, uh, a lesson in school that uh, was really negative about the industry and said oil and gas was going to go away in 10 years. And she asked me about it. And I, I said, honey, I got out of college in 1979. And I had an economics professor that urged me to reconsider my desire to go into the oil industry because it was all going to be gone in 10 years. So <laughs> this is nothing new. And no. uh, I managed to have a, a long career in oil and gas. So, well, I tell you, my, my kids <laughs> the same way had you know had have had teachers that have brought that up, and I'm I go straight to the school and just say, look, keep your opinions to yourself. You have no background, you have no science behind it. You're just you know you're infiltrating our kids with with bad data. And of yeah. course, my kids are you know they're staunch oil and gas people, but uh, <laughs> they probably don't realize who they're talking to. But uh, right. no, I, I just. <laughs> I make sure of it now. It's like, look, if you're going to lie, 
you're going to get called out. I'm just not going to let you do it. It's not a, if you bring some, look, if you want to say, Hey, look, I believe wind and solar is going to help augment the, the long-term needs of our country. I'm okay with that. But to come in and say, fossil fuels are bad. we got to get rid of them. They're killing people. And oh, by the way, wind is, that's just a lie. It ain't going to happen. Right. Well, we are running against time, Rusty. I really appreciate it. These half hours go so fast, but this has been great and uh, wish you all the best and hope to talk to you again soon. David, call anytime. All right. And thank you to the Sandstone Group for producing our show, our wonderful producer, Eric Perrell, and our sponsors at the U.S. Oil and Gas Association. I'm David Blackman, and that is all for today. <laughs>